Good afternoon. I'm pleased to call to set to order our December 10th meeting of the Phoenix City Council for a policy session. Uh, we have several uh, council members here in person, and we have someone on the phone who is with us by phone. Councilman Nowakowski. Wonderful. Welcome, Councilman. Uh, we'll begin today's meeting with council member information and follow-up requests. Do any council members have requests? Councilman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to announce tomorrow is a senior volunteer recognition event, luncheon and dance. And our volunteer service at 15 centers this year totals 100,369 hours. I just want to say thank you to all of them. And that breaks down in my area. Deer Valley has 6,748 hours. Gole Buff, 4,076 hours. So they contribute so much to our community centers and they are greatly appreciated. Also on December 21st, Pioneer Living History Museum is hosting a Pioneer Children's Party from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, it'll have bounce houses, gold panning, cowboy show, food and more, and families are invited to come out, They're putting a lot of emphasis on uh, teaching our young people about Arizona history. And I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and a Happy New Year. Thank you, Mayor. Vice Mayor. Yes, good afternoon. I am very excited to announce that this Saturday from 5 to 8 p.m., we will be having our first annual Maryville holiday celebration, or as we like to call it, our very merry Maryville. In collaboration with the Watts family, Maryville YMCA, and the Maryville Revitalization Corporation, we will have food and music and a whole tons of fun. So if you are available to please come out this Saturday from 5 to 8 at the YMCA at 3825 North 67th Avenue, it's going to be tons of fun. Not to put them on the spot, but our own city manager is going to be our Santa Claus that day. So you can come in and put in your request of what you'd like to see in the city. Um, next Saturday, um, we will also have our firefighters there giving out um, great toys for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilwoman Stark. Thank you, Mayor. Yesterday, I attended a check presentation that the Phoenix Suns Charity made to the City of Phoenix. They donated a quarter of a million dollars to fund the household starter boxes and emergency lodging. The boxes will go to people in need, uh, and they contain certain household items like cleaning supplies, dishes, bedding, etc. And of course, the emergency house lodging funds help people who are in situations where their residents have been deemed a hazard. And I, I, once again, I want to thank the Sons for their generosity. I know they've given a lot this year to um, the city of Phoenix. And I also hope that um, residents will join, e join me for our uh, District 3 holiday and donation drive next Tuesday, December the 17th from 6 to 8 p.m. It'll be at the Point Tapatio. We will be collecting donations for the Arizona Humane Society and also our fire and police departments are having a toy drive and we hope people will bring toys and we'll connect them to the police and fire. If you need any more information, it's on our Facebook. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Pastor. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I would like to uh, say that this morning I was at the U-Haul groundbreaking on their central campus for a new state-of-the-art conference and fitness center. Uh, tonight uh, I will be at uh, Encanto and uh, FQ Story tomorrow regarding solid waste. I'm very excited to be part of the Senior Volunteers Recognition Awards. And uh, tomorrow night, I'll be hosting my final uh, community coffee for 2019. Uh, Thursday night, my team and I will be at Westwood, Willow, and at St. Gregory's Neighborhood for Solid Waste. And Saturday, looking forward to the Aunt Rita's Red Brunch to celebrate with my fellow Fast Track members. I also want to end with uh, really thanking our employees and our staff for making sure that as a council, we look like we have it all together <laughs> and uh, we're, we uh, are prepared, well prepared for anything that we are speaking on or 
uh, advertising on or marketing piece, our newsletters and everything. So I really want to thank staff and our employees for the great service that they give the city of Phoenix. I uh, want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, uh, Kwanzaa, Happy Holidays, everything that goes into that, and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to uh, publicly thank the C community. We've been able to uh, plant over 550 trees in District 8. We've been doing it for the last couple of weekends. Uh, this weekend is going to be December 14th, 7.30 a.m. We're going to be starting at Grant Park um, to get the rest of those trees in. I also want to give a shout out to Public Works Department because we were able to partner uh, with these trees planting and being able to get some of our amazing compost that is, that is built out on our, on our own facility. And so that was great. Um, so yeah, this Saturday, 7.30 a.m. at Grant Park. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilman Nowakowski, do you have any updates? Any additional council updates? I'm sorry, Mayor, I couldn't get the mute button off. Um, Mayor, I just want to thank everyone that was a part of the um, light parade. What a great event, you know, the Parks and Rec and all of our staff people that put that together. There's over 100,000 individuals out there and just to see the young children's face light up when we pass by. so. I know that the Vice Mayor, um, Council Member um, Pastor, and myself were a part of that, and um, we continue to do that every year. So thank you all that make that possible for our community. Also, Chicanos por la Causa, they had um, a great Christmas. Um, they had Santa Claus, and they had a Christmas in the park where there was about 5,000 children that received gifts. So thank you to CPLC for always providing in South Phoenix a, a happy Christmas for all those children. And also, um, I was able to go to the Burton Bar Library where in our um, College Depot, we had a graduation of our online high school. It's incredible that there's a program like that. So um, people that are a little older than uh, high school age are able to graduate and, and take their GED online and the stories of the 25 individuals that graduated and the family support was just incredible. So I really want to thank all those individuals, our librarian, um, Rita, and all the people from College Depot to make that celebration such a special thing for those families and potential workforce that we have out there in the community. And finally, you know, I just want to wish everybody happy holidays and that's Feliz Navidad. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, lots of great things happening in our city. I am hoping to start a new tradition during my time as mayor where we recognize the uh, outgoing vice mayor for his service. I have a beautiful plaque that very clearly says, no taxpayer dollars were expended in the creation of this tribute. <laughs> and we never get a picture with uh, the outgoing vice mayor in the middle, perhaps, or he's always never in the front row. So we are hoping to get all council members together to recognize our outgoing vice mayor for a moment. Congratulations again, outgoing Vice Mayor. Uh, City Manager, do you have any reports or budget updates? Mayor, there are none today, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. We next turn to a topic that may be the uh, most important to our city's future, making sure we have a strong water supply. During her time as Mayor, Councilwoman Williams, who has been a long time expert on these issues, established a committee, and I will turn it over to her to introduce Agenda Item 1. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, a year ago, uh, the whole state was in a real dither over the Colorado River, uh, the diminishing water in the lake, and how we were gonna serve the public. Although we've had a lot of rain, we still are not out of the woods. A new uh, agreement was made amongst all of the river basin states. Uh, the conversations continue, but one of the focuses we had was how can we conserve more water? How can we save what we have so we know future generations will be able to have ample water supply? And so we created an ad hoc committee, and I will tell you, this committee was tremendous. I don't think anybody missed a meeting. Uh, they divided up, tackled it from three different areas, and it was a very serious, creative committee. So I just want to thank all the members, and uh, I turn it over to you, Catherine, or to you, Karen. Uh, thank you, the Mayor, Councilwoman Bethelda Williams. I so appreciate it. Uh, we've had so much fun with our, our ad hoc. Um, I want to thank you, members of the council. I'm pleased to be here with uh, this, this crew to discuss the work of the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee. Joining me at the table are a few of the Ad Hoc Committee members, uh, Warren Tenney from the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and Kate Studi, a fifth grade science and writing teacher at Maryland Elementary School here in Phoenix. Um, in the audience, uh, we have a few more Ad Hoc Committee members. Um, I wanna recognize them and thank them for their work as well. Uh, we have Cheryl Lombard uh, from Valley Partnership, uh, Krista McJunkin, SRP, and John Balfour are also here today, and I appreciate their, their presence as well. Uh, it was a lot of, a lot of great work, and, uh, and I, wanna, I wanna thank them. Also joining me are the city staff who worked with the committee, including Alan Stevenson from Planning and Development, Tim Valencia from the Office of Youth and Education, and Katherine Sorensen and Cynthia Campbell from the Water Services Department. I also want to recognize uh, a few other departments that worked with us over the course of our work, uh, the Parks Department, Streets Department, uh, Finance chipped in. We, we had a, a, full, a full house uh, working on this ad hoc committee. So thank you. Um, the role of the ad hoc committee, and, and thank you to the co-chairs, of course, uh, Councilwoman Velda Williams and Councilwoman Laura Pastor, thank you for your leadership. The role of the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee was to look at the city's current efforts in water conservation and make recommendations about possible additional efforts in light of our hotter and drier future and likely shortages on the Colorado River. The committee focused on three areas, landscaping and outdoor water use, codes and incentives, and education and outreach. Katherine Sorensen, Director of the Water Services Department, is here to describe the committee's recommendation regarding a water conservation metric. Uh, Mayor Gallego, members of the council, uh, in looking at the need for additional water conservation initiatives, the committee noted that it was important to have a goal or metric by which we could evaluate the success of the water conservation efforts. On the advice of staff, uh, the committee chose a gallons per capita per day, or GPCD, as the appropriate metric. Um, GPCD is how much water is consumed across the city per person every day. Uh, today, the city's total GPCD is 169, and that considers all water use, residential, commercial, and industrial. Uh, using total GPCD also takes into consideration the potential for growth as our service territory continues to grow. Um, so as you can see on this slide, Phoenix's total gallons per capita per day consumption has been trending downward for 30 years. Um, this downward trend is a result of our customers' commitment to a culture of conservation and being water smart. Uh, while this downward trend certainly has an impact on water revenues, it also brings tremendous benefit. For example, uh, had Phoenix's GPCD not trended downward, and were we still consuming water at the same rate we were 20 years ago, um, we would have run through all of our Colorado River water supplies and would have had to go out and attempt to acquire more supplies at very significant cost. So there is a, a huge benefit to water conservation in that regard as well. 
Uh, gallons per capita per day is also a measurement used by the state to gauge our compliance with the Groundwater Management Act. Uh, Phoenix continues to exceed its expectations for GPCD. The state's current target for Phoenix is 209. Uh, as I said, today we're at 169 uh, gallons per capita per day. Staff believes that we can continue this downward trend by implementing the recommendations made by this committee. Uh, this committee recommends in its report that the city reduce its total GPCD from 169 today to 155 by the year 2030. Uh, we would now like to turn to the specific recommendations made by the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, Tim Valencia, the Youth and Education Manager in the City Manager's Office, is here to discuss the recommendations related to education and outreach. Good afternoon, Mayor Gago, members of the Council. The Education and Outreach Subcommittee, which included our local educator, Kate Studi, right here next to us, looked at the city's current outreach efforts uh, to K-12 students and the community and we identified efforts and other opportunities to further our outreach. The subcommittee met several times over the course of several months and suggested the following recommendations. The first recommendation is to expand our current youth and education outreach efforts citywide. Water Services already reaches over 3,000 school children in Phoenix each year, but the committee saw opportunity to maximize current efforts by enlisting the Youth and Education Office to convene a group of local educators, like Ms. Studi here, to advise the city on better ways to communicate with schools and educators on current resources available. The local uh, educators will also assist us in aligning and identifying those current resources with the current Arizona Science Standards. Water Services also plans to expand water conservation education efforts in other city programs, such as our PAC after school programs. The, pro the proposal also includes expanding the number of school visits from 19 currently to 40 each school year and adding a fourth water festival event that reaches multiple schools within a school district. The second recommendation is to establish a volunteer program to assist in water conservation activities. Water services staff will coordinate with the city's volunteers office to create opportunities to incorporate volunteers into current water conservation outreach efforts. Water Services is also developing an interim program for local college students to assist in water conservation research. Lastly, our subcommittee recommends advocating to the Arizona Department of Education to include water conservation in the Arizona Science Standards. The current Arizona Science Standards do not specifically include water conservation. The, the standards actually include va uh, really vague verbiage uh, such as resource, resources considered readily available in the past are becoming scarcer and more valued. Thus, as per capita consumption of natural resources increase, so do the negative impacts. The standards do not provide clear guidance for teaching water conservation in the classroom. By convening our local educators, as I stated earlier, our educators will assist us in preparing a recommendation for the Arizona Department of Education to include water conservation the next time they update and adopt new science standards. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Kate Studi, our local educator who served on our water conservation ad hoc committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Gallego and the council members. Um, I am a fifth grade teacher, science and writing in the Washington School District at Maryland Elementary School. And I had the privilege of being chosen to represent my school, my district, and educators in the city as part of this committee. Um, I've never served on a committee at this level before, and I was excited and, to be honest, a little bit intimidated um, to be part of the process of making these important decisions about the future of our city. I was equally excited to bring my experience serving on this committee back to my students in the classroom so that they can better understand how our government works and um, the importance of water conservation in our city. As an educator and citizen of the city of Phoenix, I'm in full support of the recommendations being presented today, and the items specific to water conservation education are of particular importance to me and my students. We have the potential to make thousands of Phoenix school children um, water conservation champions in their homes and in their communities. And these students will eventually become our new decision makers. And I think by expanding this education program, we will make them informed decision makers of the future. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kate. Uh, next is Ellen Stevenson, the Planning and uh, Development Director, who will be presenting recommendations from the Landscaping and Outdoor Water Use and Codes and Incentives Subcommittee. Good afternoon, Mayor Gago, members of the Council. Approximately 70% of residential water use is outdoors. The Landscaping and Outdoor Water Use Subcommittee examined opportunities to improve water conservation while preserving the lifestyle people love in Phoenix. These recommendations include offering uh, free zero-scape plans to residential customers. So the city will develop several standardized residential plans uh, that will have zero-scaping uh, built into them. They'll be free to download from the city's website so that homeowners can voluntarily make a conversion to more water, to less water-intensive landscapes uh, by choosing to, to do so. Uh, the city will conduct a contest for landscape architects to develop these plans so there's several different lot sizes and we'll be able to effectively download what a resident would need and then be able to, to go forward having that installed or install it themselves and be able to save water. Um, this is a clear example of how we're trying to uh, shift people's uh, attention and, and focus, but at the same time not making it mandatory so that people can do that if they, they wish to do it. Uh, the second recommendation is on redesigning the City Hall water feature. Uh, many of us see that as we walk in back and forth between uh, council chambers and City Hall, and this is a contest to look at redesigning it so that is a focus on water conservation um, and another example of the city being able to lead by example uh, with showing how we can conserve water instead of continue to have the, the water fountain out there. The third recommendation is uh, one that it really targets uh, how we uh, are out in the field and how the city works cohesively across many different departments. And uh, so the Water Services Department has developed uh, door hangers that you guys have copies of in front of you that are in English on one side, Spanish on the other side. Uh, and those hangers will be available to all field staff across various departments so that when they see a water leak that is uh, someone's uh, water dripping out of their grass uh, from their sprinklers overrunning, uh, going down the street. Uh, if it's one of my inspectors out there, or a neighborhood services inspector, they'll be able to, to grab that door hanger, put it on there to make sure that people are aware of uh, the impacts of that, and it directs the, those uh, persons to the water services department who have that expertise, but that way we're not having staff that are out there having to, to focus and look at these, uh, but also making sure that we are uh, responding that we don't want to see water wasted uh, going down the street. Uh, the next recommendation is to update the, the building codes on a three-year cycle. So the Planning and Development Department currently does it in about a five-year cycle, and what staff uh, is looking at with this is looking at the most current codes to make sure that we stay on those and uh, be efficient with our water conservation technology. So as the new codes come out, they're continuing to get more efficient. We would uh, like to be able to continue in that same vein. Uh, the next recommendation is our commercial cooling tower program, and in this particular instance, Sky Harbor uh, developed a retrofit program to their cooling towers that saved enough water uh, to serve 260 homes for a year. And so the city is working to develop a targeted uh, outreach program to persuade, persuade some of our commercial customers who have these same type of large uh, commercial cooling towers that if they can make the switch, uh, they will also save uh, water and be able to generate uh, additional savings for their particular businesses in terms of, of water uh, costs as well as water conservation. This is a voluntary program, but the target here is to uh, do five uh, commercial cooling towers a, a year so that we can try and again promote people to transition to more efficient water use technologies that are out there that are reliable and, and more widely available. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Cynthia Campbell, the city's water resources management advisor. Mayor Gallego and members of the council, both the landscaping and the outdoor water use subcommittee and the codes and incentives subcommittee made several recommendations for expanded or new programs designed to incentivize Phoenix water customers to use technologies to improve outdoor and indoor water use. These recommendations included the following. Expand the Water Services Department Homeowners Association Water Efficiency Program. This program was started as a pilot to engage interested HOAs in reducing their outdoor water use, saving money and water. 
The program involves development of a water budget by Phoenix Water Conservation Specialists based on the current landscape on the HOA property. The expansion of the program has the goal of expanding the voluntary audits from 9 to 40 per year. And if the HOAs adopt the recommendation based on the 40 audits, this program could conserve 180 million gallons each year or enough water to serve over 2,000 homes for a year. Another recommendation from the subcommittees was the Smart Irrigation Controller Program. Phoenix has an opportunity to partner with SRP to expand SRP's current program of selling smart irrigation controllers to residential customers at a discounted rate. Using SRP's existing vendors and pricing, customers pay $60 and the city subsidizes at $75 per controller with a goal of distributing 1,000 controllers. This could save over 8 million gallons of water each year based upon the use of 1,000 controllers. Another recommendation is a new toilet retrofit program. Phoenix has a long-standing toilet replacement for program for low-income customers that includes the toilet and professional installation at no cost. Under this recommendation, water services would keep the low-income program and evaluate the feasibility of adding a $75 rebate program for all customers who purchase and install their own toilet regardless of income level. The new program could save over 20 million gallons of water each year or enough to serve over 240 homes each year. Another recommendation is a water budget calculator. Water Services is building a web-based tool for residential customers to develop water budgets for their indoor and outdoor water use. A water budget considers the current watering needs, the landscaping and the fixtures within a particular home and determines the amount of water necessary to meet those needs. Customers could use the water budget on a voluntary basis to judge their own water use and determine whether they have, see opportunities for efficiencies. And finally, the committee recommended Water Services pilot landscape contract. Under this recommendation, Water Services will bid its own landscape contract for the over 200 city-owned sites it manages. The contracts will incorporate water budgets developed for each site with the assistance of ASU interns. The goal is to evaluate the effectiveness of this type of contract and possibly incorporate these measures into other city landscape contracts. In the meantime, other city departments will extend their citywide landscape contracts for a short term and work together to discuss other efficiencies and standardization opportunities. Cynthia, does this include also the transportation? The, the contracts, pilot. the, the uh, contracts that we have been talking about that are in um, streets and transportation on how we, the whole landscaping piece. Mayor Gallego, Councilwoman Pastor, it includes those in that separate conversation about looking for other efficiencies. The one, the pilot that uses the uh, water budgets is limited to water services this year but Streets is doing additional things on their own to work towards additional efficiencies. Yes, because that's the convers th th this is what brought the conversation to, to where it is today. And so I wanna make sure transportation and streets, uh, landscaping uh, piece is part of uh, moving forward and implementing what needs to be implemented because they have the majority of the contracts. Mayor, so I don't know how to put that in there or what do I need to do? Uh, Councilwoman, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, we've worked very closely with the finance department to examine the status of those citywide and uh, department specific landscaping contracts. As Cynthia alluded, um, there will be some action required of the council in the short term to extend some of those contracts so that we can incorporate 
these consistent requirements across the citywide landscape contracts. So that'll be coming very soon um, uh, in, in concert with our procurement staff. Okay, I just wanna make sure that those elements then are embedded in the new um, RFP, I guess, is what, what we're going for. And that the new elements of what has happened in our work is now moving into other departments or other areas of contract. Okay, thank you. Yes. Councilwoman Williams. Uh, Karen, doesn't this also, uh, um, all the companies that deal with the landscaping or vegetation that are under the city's control, won't this be part of the next budget cycle? Because it's gonna make some changes on how they put the new irrigation systems in, how they monitor and, the, and how they measure the water. Yes, uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Williams, to the extent that the new scopes of work require that additional um, education and, and management, um, that will come forward when those contracts are procured. Um, the additional work required uh, may, may result in uh, changes to the costs of those contracts, but that'll be determined through the procurement process. But it has to be added to their budget, is what I'm asking, yes. I think. Because I know uh, by the time we add the trees, irrigation system, and uh, the monitor and how much water you're using, there's gonna be additional expense for a while to get it up and running. And I, I'm, understand what where she's coming from but i just want to make sure that everybody's in agreement that that will be in part of the negotiations this spring yes uh mayor councilwoman williams uh, we will be examining that very closely the pilot program that water services is doing will uh, allow us to really examine how to manage those contracts and build that information into future contracts so it's, it will be a very helpful exercise so uh, to sum up, uh, while we cannot quantify today the precise volume of water that will be saved by these recommendations, we know that conservatively implementing the recommendations will annually save over 300 million gallons or enough water to fill more than 30,000 swimming pools. So to provide some additional context and perspective on the need and timeliness of water conservation, I'd like to introduce Warren Tenney, Executive Director of the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and a member of the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee. Thank you, Mayor Gallego and members of the council. I appreciated the opportunity to serve on this ad hoc committee and we had productive meetings with your water services and other city staff to develop these recommendations. I believe these recommendations are well thought out and they build upon the city of Phoenix's accomplishments in water conservation and shows that Phoenix is continuing to be a leader in water demand management and using water wisely. Phoenix and other cities here in the Valley have worked hard to have effective conservation programs that educate and inform the public to create a strong conservation ethic in Arizona. Yet this effort never ends. With all the recent attention given to um, upcoming Colorado River shortages, DCP, drought, climate change, state leaders, business groups, and the public are talking more about water conservation, and they are watching to see what, the city, what action the cities are going to take. We have legislators who want to see more conservation, and other legislators that believe the cities have not done enough. It is important for us to continue to tout the great strides we have made in water conservation and also to take action that fosters the wise use of water among our citizens. So I commend you for being proactive and for being willing to take measured steps forward to improve and increase water efficiency here in Phoenix. Thank you. 
So as the committee developed these recommendations for additional conservation measures, staff evaluated the necessary resources to implement the recommendations. The initial cost to implement the recommendation is approximately $1.5 million, and the annual cost to maintain the conservation programs is $1.3 million. These figures include the cost of the rebates, subsidies, vehicles and equipment, and five full-time equivalents, including a supervisor. While the final report and recommendations of the committee are before you today for approval, staff will include the necessary resources in the budget process that begins in January for fiscal year 2021. So on behalf of the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee, today we're asking the council to approve the final report, which includes a water conservation metric and recommendations for improving water conservation in the city of Phoenix. The council also, or the committee, also recommends that the council review implementation of the recommendations in two years. And we're happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you to our chairwoman, the ad hoc committee, and our staff for putting forward these recommendations. Uh, do we have a comment from our chair, our co-chair? Oh, I was just going to make a motion. <laughs> Let's. So, and we do have two ahead. members or, of the public slash ad hoc here to address the public. Councilwoman Stark. Just a point of clarification, going back to the building codes. I know there are a three-year cycle, but um, sometimes cities and towns in Arizona don't necessarily adopt them every three years because there isn't anything significant as far as the state of Arizona. For example, maybe three years from now, there's something that has to do with snow loads in Minnesota, <laughs> and so they rewrite the, the building codes and then the cities here, especially in southern Arizona, don't adopt them. So is there some flexibility? Because I know those books cost a ton of money. So I just want to make sure, I mean, I, I want us to stay current, and I think it's important that we review every three years, but if there's not a reason to adopt, is there ability maybe to bypass so we don't have to go and buy all the books and go through all the training, which really becomes very costly for your department? Uh, certainly, uh, Mayor Gallego, uh, Councilwoman Stark, um, the, the way staff would uh, apply uh, this particular policy if, if the council uh, you know approves these recommendations is that when the new codes do come out we would look to evaluate those codes and see if there are one or two things that we should pull out um, uh, that might be efficient might be newer technologies to use or uh, if there's a, a whole lot of changes and a lot of good things then we may uh, elect to adopt the, you know all of them in, in mass but there would always be uh, Phoenix amendments to those to, to make some changes but it wouldn't be something that every three years we would uh, just adopt without an evaluation analysis of is it really necessary okay. um, because it is costly to the department as well as uh, you know the construction industry and trades as well and so we always work with our our partners on evaluating those and then what to bring forward uh, you know for the council adoption okay. just as long as we have flexibility because I know it can become a cost issue and I'm happy to hear that thank you mayor councilman DeCicio so when this first came out of subcommittee my understanding or the, the there was no employee needed or anything else and that uh, I think two of the projects took almost 90 percent of the water savings how do we get from no employees to seven how'd that happen I mean that's my concern with this uh, mayor council member just to see I'm sorry I'm at a loss I'm not sure um, where you're um, I don't remember ever saying this would take no employees, so I'm at a loss there. Oh, I think there was two and a half, I think, for the original. I can't remember what all um, the numbers we have. Were we have two employees who are currently doing all of our existing programs, so maybe that's the confusion. Yeah. Um, Cynthia did um, it, a lot of work trying to figure out exactly how many employees she would need uh, to implement these new programs. Um, so I'll let Cynthia talk to um, how she developed the. It just seemed the like a lot. It's a, it seemed like a big jump. Yeah. But um, Mayor Gallo, Councilman DeCicio, um, I developed the staffing plan based upon the needs of each program, and, and 
those FTE, and there's actually only five additional FTE. We have an existing two, so a total of seven. Okay. Um, but with seven, we would be able to do these programs on, we would be able to spread the people around enough to do all of the programs. But as it is, even with the FTE that we would be adding, those FTE would be doing multiple functions, not just one recommendation or one program, but multiple. Um, so that was pretty much the staffing levels that we thought we needed to be able to adequately do these programs, given that we're only at two currently. And then the two employees that we have right now, my understanding is they can handle what the, the main recommendations that covered, I think, 80 or 90 percent of the water savings. Uh, it's Mayor, okay to tell me I'm wrong. No, Mayor Cayago, <laughs> Councilman DeCicio, no, they, they actually could not. Um, right now, with two, uh, we are basically handling the existing education function, which is not the recommendation in terms of additional educational outreach, but just the current educational outreach. Um, our HOA program, which was a pilot, borrowed an employee who is no longer with the city and wasn't slated for conservation. So some of those programs literally are missing uh, staff resources right now. So I'm going to be supportive of this today, but with the caveat and the concern of, you know, it just seems like an, you know, I'm always worried about adding more staff on because sooner or later you got to pay for it. And especially if we can handle some of the functions that are already being done. So I'll be supportive of it today with that concern based into it. Vice Mayor. Yes, I, I would also, well, one, I want to say thank you. It was a great presentation. Always good to hear that we're trying to figure out how do we conserve more water is something that we're always very um, worried about. Um, but with that being said, like, I will also be supportive of this, of what we have in front of us today. But I'm, I'm, I would also like to see what's the plan for those five positions. Like where there, you know, where are those positions gonna come from, and how are we, how we're actually gonna gonna staff that, right? Because I, I, or do we know how we're gonna staff them, or what we're doing with that? Uh, so, Mayor, Vice Mayor, um, that was the idea behind not asking the council to approve those positions today. We need to go back and scrub our numbers, um, really make sure that we're asking for the amount we need, no more. And then we want to take a look at what we can do within our department, how we could maybe move some resources around, and then bring that discussion forward as part of the normal budget process for your consideration. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, I would just like for you guys to let us be part of, part of that process in terms of how that's going to happen, because I wouldn't like to see other departments lose um, positions in, in order to make this happen. So if we can just be part of the dialogue, I think that'd be great. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilman Waring. Um, so I'm generally supportive of most of the stuff in here, um, like the education component. Um, ask my family to the irritation of them <laughs> in, since I was a little kid. You know, they taught us to turn off the lights mm -hmm. at school. That was a thing, and I still do it. But I think that's the kind of thing you got to inculcate in kids. So, so that first part I think is important. Stuff like the fountain outside. If the fountain is an issue. I might argue to whoever's in charge of the fountain at the city or Ed, you know, turn off the fountain if it's really wasting it. I don't know how many people in Phoenix are coming down and are taking how they treat water away from the fountain. So it's good to be a good steward, but I mean, how much would it cost to reconfigure that thing? It's a pretty big fountain and so forth. So some of this stuff is, is smaller. I will say in regards to the staffer, I'm, I'm usually the guy who's like, don't hire more staffers. But for example, the HOA component, which I, f I find to be a, a crucial component. Um, we have big ones, Desert Ridge, right? They have big open spaces, they have a whole park, they have a lot of stuff that, that, that they control that's green space up there. Um, you're gonna design, the whole, your staff is gonna design their plan, correct? So I mean, that, that is a time intensive effort. Putting out the door hangers is a time intensive effort. Um, I was pleased because we discussed it and I had some qualms about how that might be handled. Having seen it, it was better than I anticipated, so uh, I appreciated that because, you know, you, you don't want to just go up to somebody, hey, you've got this problem, nah, 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 and we can't help. <laughs> it actually has some 
some things about here. Here's what you might want to look at and call us if you're still confused, or you don't know what we're talking about, or something. Um, so, I mean, again, that's a time-intensive activity. Somebody's actually got to physically do it, right? And I assume that's what these two plus five people are doing. Um, you know, the the uh, zero escape plans. I mean, again, that's somebody's got to actually do that, right? Uh, so there's a lot of stuff in here that might be labor intensive, but it does seem like there's going to be a payoff. We've already had success, as you showed in your slide, going from the, I think it was 206 or 209 down to the 169 or 6, I can't remember the exact number. Um, I, I think the 155 is a good goal, but I, actually it possibly could be more, which is important given the population growth. So. So this is, I, I applaud the committee chairman and, and the folks who worked on it and certainly the citizen volunteers for being so active and coming up with really concrete policies that could get implemented. The staffers will have to compete in the next budget process, correct? So that's not something we're voting on today. This is simply to go forward, try to implement the, or get the program in place to be implemented and then it wouldn't start till next June 1st, is that correct? Ed or Karen or whoever's the the, I, the uh, programs that would need staffing would not start until July 1st right. based on as you described a councilman competing in the city's budget process and also to assure the vice mayor we would not rearrange resources from other departments into water it would only be within water if there were but yes it would be anything that did not need staff could be implemented sooner than July 1st but the staffing components would need to wait until a council action on the budget which I'm guessing, you didn't break it out that way, but I'm assuming that's probably most of it wouldn't be starting till July 1st. But anything you can start that's helpful, that, that's great. But uh, you're already doing programs in the schools, correct? This would just be sort of more of that, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm supportive and, uh, and happy with the result. Thank you. Councilwoman Pestor. Well, I'm glad uh, Waring's volunteering for District 2 because it's labor intensive and we know he goes door to door every day. <laughs> so That's I will provide a, a flyer for you. <laughs> if you need my help, I'll go help you. Um, <laughs> but uh, when it comes to the water, I, I ask that question in the sense of what's the significant, there's a reason why it was built the way it was built. Is there any significance behind it? Uh, just like we have our memorial, I'm, the water for me is, is, this, is the same way I look at it, um, the same way Waring is looking at it. And, and I think there's other areas that we can really uh, make an impact. And uh, I'm not sure what the cost of that would be. That Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, so the water feature at City Hall, um, it would we would initiate a design contest so that uh, individuals who uh, are able to submit a design that that really features water conservation in a water feature um, and educates uh, the community about how to do that in the most water efficient way possible. That's the idea behind that recommendation. Yeah, I, I understand that, but I guess what I'm saying is uh, to add some clarity to that, I, if it's going to cost Yes. Then I'm saying uh, at this moment, I think we have better uh, items or other uh, areas that we can work on. I think the redesign of the fountain would be another decision point for the council, as I understand it. So you would do a contest, you would get the designs that were the winners, and then part of that evaluation would be how cost effective that is, but then it would be do we implement it or not? That would be another point at which the council could say, our resources are better placed somewhere else. Right, that's and correct. How do I want to say this? I, I understand that. I guess what I'm saying is maybe we shouldn't go down that road. Um, I know it's a recommendation from the uh, committee, but maybe we, instead of involving all the community and get everybody uh, participating, and then at the end of the day, council feels like it's not necessary and we have everybody once again participating and engaging and then we say no. I think so. it would be certainly a, an acceptable motion if the council wanted to pull that out from the others and hold that aside uh, for further study and consideration. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Garcia. <clears throat> uh, thank you all for the work. This is great. 
Um, <clears throat> I think this is a little, this is great outwardly facing. I'm wondering if how much was done inward. Um, and in, since we're talking about positions and maybe moving people from different units or, or that, um, is there needs that you all just turn now. Let's say with, uh, with you know, more folks to fix water leaks or like other things that would conserve in an internal fashion. And so I was just wondering if we could kind of partner this and since we're gonna be kind of moving for, for funds for the water department, I think it would make sense to also make some internal recommendations. Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Garcia, thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, the answer is absolutely. Um, actually, uh, several years ago now, um, under um, City Manager Ed Zerker's leadership, we instituted an internal citywide water conservation task force. And that, that uh, task force has done a tremendous amount of work examining um, uh, fixtures within city facilities, looking at landscape contracts, working with the airport on their cooling tower program. We've made huge strides in the city, um, and we're, we're really proud of that. And we wanted to have those accomplishments in place before we then turn to the community and ask the community to do more as well. So absolutely, there's a partnership there that is very important to us. And I think what, what matters is that we are vigilant in, in both areas, that we continue to focus on what we need to do internally, but then we turn and ask our customers to do more as well. Yeah, and it, was, it wasn't a criticism. It was more kind absolutely. of like, how else can we support on, on both sides? Um, the other thing is just if we could speak a little bit more on like the outreach and partnership plan, um, just how that would look like with the, you mentioned working with ASU and that, that kind of stuff. Mayor Councilman Garcia, the way it would work uh, in terms of the interns that we currently have been working with from ASU, actually the ASU interns developed all of the water budgets that we're going to use in our landscaping contract for water services. And one of the actual, and, and this is a great opportunity to somewhat answer a question that Councilwoman Pastor raised earlier, and one of the reasons that we are using these interns going forward as well is, is that they're going to help us develop the water budgets for the other departments, such as streets, because currently we don't have water budgets developed for all of the street sites, and ASU interns will definitely be helpful to us in that. Uh, in addition to that, in the education and outreach area, we use, uh, we partner with a, a partner, I'm sorry, Project WET, which is a uh, organization out of the University of Arizona that does uh, curriculum for fourth grade students statewide. So they help us with the, they actually do the water festivals and we help staff those with them. So going forward to expand that outreach, especially in the water festivals, we will have to work directly with Project WET uh, as a nonprofit to continue to, to reach out a little more. And one last thing, the intention of these is not just that those five folks are gonna go put them out, but it's actually that all departments are not gonna have, right? Just clarifying. Yes, yes. Uh, Mayor Councilman Garcia, I am very happy you asked that question because I definitely did not wanna leave that impression. There is no amount of the five FTE that were, that I've looked at that would be involved in putting door hangers out. Not one part of the FTE would be involved in that. That's all existing city staff. Maybe district two. <laughs> just teasing you wearing, just teasing. <laughs> no, Councilwoman you're not. Pastor. <laughs> the, uh, the water, the water, um, I wanna say sculpture, but it's not sculpture, wall. Is that recycled water? In the fountain. In the fountain. So, uh, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, it, it is not reclaimed water in the sense of it being wastewater that was reclaimed. Um, it, but the fountain does, re, you know, it Recycle. recirculates, yeah, it rec right? It yeah. pumps over and over. So, um, the, the water use in that regard is somewhat minimized. But okay, yeah, that's what I wanted on the record. Um, we have two cards: uh, Cheryl Lombard, followed by Krista McJunkin.
Thank you, thank you, Mayor, thank you, Council. Cheryl Lombard, President and CEO of Valley Partnership. Valley Partnership is a trade association for the real estate development industry. We're not connected with any national organization and we advocate for responsible development, which includes as one of our platforms to ensure economic vitality tools such as secure water supplies, a well-educated workforce and transportation and infrastructure. I had the privilege of being a member of the Arizona Steering Committee for the Drought Contingent Plan, known as DCP, and the issue of water conservation was a topic that came up in those discussions. And it was also, as it was already mentioned, a topic of discussion at our legislature. I want to applaud the City of Phoenix for um, creating this ad hoc group to really get ahead of the game and go to the next level in terms of conservation because you've already been a leader in it. Um, I, I applaud and I was happy to participate in the ad hoc committee and Valley Partnership is in support of the recommendations. Um, I want to thank you first for the process of this ad hoc committee. It was a great experience. We've already talked about how the, the city manager, staff, the different planning departments, but the committee itself. Um, we had our leaders from the uh, council member Pastor and Williams, but we also had um, citizens and then I'll say more on the expert side. So it was a great makeup. It was a good process and I appreciate that. As well, um, and besides supporting the recommendations recommendations, I want to call attention to really two of them. First is the commercial cooling tower. Uh, representing the real estate development industry, our members are excited about this and we look forward to working with the staff, whether it's the water department, planning staff, and even Christine Mackey and economic development to identify either current development projects or incoming um, new development projects that we can benefit and, convert and potentially put this in. As well, the discussion that was had on the building codes, we're in support of that as necessary. We know it's a cost and also um, would impact our membership. So we look forward to working. We're in support of this, and I welcome uh, any questions. Oh, Mayor? Councilmember DeCicio. A question to Cheryl. Cheryl, you and I had a conversation a long time ago, maybe three or four years ago, about a long-term delivery system of using a pipeline either from California mm -hmm. or Mexico or something like that. But the biggest problem that we ran into, other than the piping itself, was the electrical side of it in the power generation that you need for a desalinization plant. There's something new that's occurred is that now in the last couple of years at least, California now has an abundance of electricity that they can't get rid of because of all the solar plants that they have. Just as a thought, take it back to your counterparts and just something to think about that maybe we work out some sort of agreement. You know, you can do this at the state level and you, you've got the ability to do a lot of this because you're actually brilliant when it comes to water along with Catherine. You two are amazing at it. So. Something to think about using that excess power to either put the water that you get from either California or Mexico, because they could sell it down to Mexico or not even sell it or just use it, right? Use recharge basins and then be able to pull that water out later mm -hmm. through a delivery system. Just something to think about. It's all, it's changed in the last couple of years since you and I had that conversation, I think probably close, maybe five years ago. Yeah, you know, it Something was. to think about. I was at a different job, I think. <laughs> well, you were. You were at the Nature Conservancy. And, but there is that, that, the, that excess power that they just, I mean, they're basically giving it to Arizona for free, but they still don't know what else to do, and it's on the off hours. It can be done that way, and you can actually power those plants when you don't need peak, peak energy. Something to think about. No, I appreciate that. Mind. Mayor and Council. Um, uh, Warren and I, I think Catherine, I'm not sure from the city staff, we sit on the governor's augmentation council where we are discussing many of those, about the short term and the long term solutions and, and definitely desal and augmentation is a big part of that. But now you have power. Yeah, no, you you're right. Have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Krista. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego, council members. I'm Krista McJunkin. I'm the director of water strategy for Salt River Project and also a member of the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee. I'd first like to thank my fellow committee members for their willingness to both ask lots of questions and share their knowledge so that we could work together to come up with these proposals for you. I'd also like to commend the city staff that supported the Ad Hoc Committee across multiple departments for their diligence and professionalism. They really helped keep the prog um, the um, committee moving and uh, tackling issues with good information and good support so that we came up with a solid plan. I'm proud of the work that the committee members and city staff put into the ad hoc committee report. 
I believe the water conservation initiatives presented to the City Council comprise a thoughtful, balanced approach to city water conservation, and I urge the Council to approve the plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your service on our committee. Councilwoman Pastor, do you have a motion? So uh, I would like to thank the committee, because uh, the committee was so diverse in all different aspects of water conservation, and i really like to thank all your efforts because it took a lot of time, and to me, time is money. But uh, we got to where we are today and, and uh, with an awesome plan. And so I'm gonna make the motion uh, to prove, approve the Water Conservation Ad Hoc Committee plan with the removal of the fountain and to relook at that in two years. And if there's any issue with it, with, between the two years, I would, uh, I would like you to bring it back if there's, there's an issue. And then review implementation plan, oh, review implementation plan in two years. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Any opposed? Aye. Passes unanimously. Congratulations to all those involved in bringing this forward. I look forward to implementing and staying updated. It is so important to the future of our city that we manage our water responsibly. We next move to agenda item number two, which is our international trade strategy update. We are lucky to be joined by many of our partners in international strat strategy, including our partners in the Mexican Consul's Office. So thank you for your longtime partnership and being here with us today. I will turn it over to our assistant city manager to introduce the item. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. We're happy to be here today to provide an update from the Community and Economic Development Department on our ongoing efforts to develop a, a global international strategy. Uh, I will turn it over to Chris Mackey, our Community and Economic Development Director. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the council. With me today uh, is Gretchen Wolf, Program Manager with Community and Economic Development. Her oversight is over our procurement office, so she sits here in that expertise. Uh, in uh, your November 6th meeting, you gave a staff direction to go back and work on a plan to bring forward a global, in, an international, long-term international strategy. As we look at that strategy, Phoenix is growing in population to nearly 1.7 million people. And as we continue to grow, our businesses become more and more diverse from multiple companies. As we look at our exports in Arizona, 68% of all of the exports that happen in Arizona do happen from uh, Maricopa County, from the greater Phoenix area. In that international development, um, Mayor and I were really excited to learn when we were together. I just found the information of our top five exports today. Aircraft parts and aircraft themselves have moved into the number one position. Number two is in uh, electronic products. Think semiconductor and microchips and those types of things. Mining, electrical equipment, and machinery. Of those export companies, Mexico, of course, is our top export partner, followed by Canada, China, the UK, and Japan. Our exports continue to grow. The most recent information we have is the end of 2017, and they've grown over, uh, over a four-year period of time by just over 20%. In the most recent year, about $14.4 billion. We look at our existing international businesses. This is information staff was really excited to do a deep dive on. We have businesses from 50 countries. It's uh, more than 2,500 of our businesses are from other countries or trade or originate from other countries, and 85,000 direct jobs are based for those international companies. I think it's important to note those are only jobs that work directly for those companies. If you look at the economic multiplier just from, and suppliers and support, just from Canada and Mexico alone, it accounts for about 228,000 jobs. And these aren't all just large companies. About 25% of our export jobs and exports come from our small and medium enterprises. We, so we always talk about exports. Yes, Mayor. Councilman Williams. An actual list of the companies in Phoenix or even in the county, uh, 
by country, name and country? Mayor, Councilwoman Williams, absolutely. We'd be happy to provide that. We do have that data. Our partner at MAG uh, collects that data and our research department works with that. We'll print that out and share that with you. Thank you. We often talk about exports. I think it's important to talk about our two-way trade, both imports and exports. In 2018, uh, Mexico, we were up 7.7% with about six, just over $16 billion. Uh, China is up over 11%, and Canada is up approximately 2.4%. As we see that two-way trade happening, as we've talked about, Mexico is our largest trading partner at $16.6 .6 billion. As we've looked at what we do in our Mexico offices, we're often asked why we select where we do our trade missions, why we select our offices, why we select the, the trade shows we do. And it's those areas that are most closely connected to the work that we do here in Phoenix and the disciplines that we recruit to. So as we fly in, you'll see our electronics businesses, medical devices in Mexico, the clustering advanced manufacturing of automotive, of aerospace, and innovation. And you'll see those areas are clustered where a Phoenix does most of its business in northern Mexico, around Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterey. If we look at the North American Free Trade Agreement since its uh, inception in uh, 1994, we've seen Arizona exports increase by more than 300%. It's our understanding from some information that was released that a, a transaction is very close to being approved in DC on the modification of the USMCA. We have great hope that over the next 25 years, we'll see equal, if not greater, potential in our trade uh, with Canada and with Mexico. Uh, this was interesting to us. This is the entire country and where their primary trading partner is. You'll see in the Southwest, we are predominantly our largest trading partner is Mexico. In the Midwest and Northeast, uh, the most common trading partner is in Canada. Uh, as we look at both a short-term and a long-term plan for our global strategies, on the short term, it is our Mexico offices that we have had in operation, city offices in both Hermosillo and Mexico City. Uh, we would propose that those offices uh, reopen and provide business assistance, uh, business connections, business attraction, investment opportunities. Uh, again, as I said, with me here today is Gretchen Wolf, our procurement officer, who would walk you through kind of this, uh, the staff's proposal of reopening of our Mexico offices, but um, more directly focused for a period limited to just one year. Gretchen? Councilman Williams. Are you going to have these offices operating differently than they have the last couple of years? Mayor, Councilwoman Williams, what we would look to, what staff would, would look to um, um, offering would be those offices would report directly to City of Phoenix staff. We would work solely on business to business opportunities and creating new business to come into Phoenix for that year while we look on the long-term strategy uh, as opposed to those offices had operated pri uh, previously in trade delegations. They had done uh, dignitary visits. They'd done other things in the market. In this instance, it would be really just working with city staff on ensuring that we maintain uh, the business activity that we've seen while we work on that further long-term plan. So are you hiring a company to work with staff, or are you going to recruit a staff member who has the knowledge, the ability, and the contacts to make this happen. Mayor Councilman Williams, what we'd walk you through next would be our suggestion for a solicitation in Mexico where we would get someone in Mexico to operate um, um, an Hermosillo office and someone in Mexico to operate a Mexico City office. One of my team members would oversee those two contracts on the short term while uh, we worked to bring a long-term strategy back to council in uh, March or, or late spring. So there would, it would be city staff uh, and we would do a solicitation to put someone in charge of running our Mexico offices for us as opposed to a, a third party between. Councilman Waring. So I, I was kind of curious in reading this. So. I don't think I'm wrong. This is reopening the same offices we just closed? 
Mayor, um, Councilman Waring, it would, it, in the cities, it would be the same uh, cities that we would propose opening them in. Uh, we would run a, a competitive solicitation to see what um, applicants we got through that response. And then a panel would sit and we'd make a recommendation to bring back to city council once we went through that solicitation. Those individuals who have worked in the existing Mexico offices uh, would be absolutely welcome to apply, but it would be a broader than just opening those exact offices. It would be those two cities, but we'd bring back to council who those um, offices would be run by. So I guess, Mayor, so it's not the same actual offices, but it's the same locations. The difference would be we wouldn't have an Arizona firm overseeing it, and it would be a slim down job set for what would be going on. You talked about dignitaries and so forth. So it would be less than it was before. You'd be skipping, I don't know how else to phrase it, sort of the middleman or somebody from Arizona that we hire. It would be somebody from your staff. I guess I wonder, when your staff, is this gonna be somebody we're gonna then locate in Mexico? Or, I mean, how are they gonna know what's going on down there um, when we don't have, you know, some eyes on the actual activity and I mean how, how quickly can that be done you're talking about doing a solicitation in a foreign country uh, do we have an expertise to do that mayor councilman wearing lots of great questions um, as we look at first let me go back to the first one and kind of work my way forward while the are existing you know the groups that were in our offices are welcome to apply so I want to be very transparent it could be the same office that we had before. It'll be the same countries. Right. If they apply and they were to come in, I just want to be very transparent about that. Uh, as we look at uh, oversight of the activity, so to your next question was, it's a much more slimmed down version of a solicitation than we had previously. This would be uh, not doing the, the trade missions. It would be not handling the, the dignitary visits or that type of activity. Our sister cities, and other team members that we have would oversee that, uh, our international department on the short term till we come back to you with a long-term plan. So this would be simply business to business, a much more scaled down uh, contract that we would bring forward. On our existing staff, we have a couple of staff members who have very strong Mexico expertise, who one of them or both of them would work together to have the oversight of those offices. We're very fortunate in this day and age to have a lot more technology in place than we've had previously. There's Skype, uh, you know, uh, go to meetings. There's, there's lots of ways to stay in contact and the oversight with metrics and reporting that would take place uh, to ensure that the work was being done in Mexico. We did, uh, you know, we've done a number of visits down into Mexico, so I would anticipate uh, either me or those staff members over that year long contract uh, flying in and meeting with those individuals and ensuring that the work was being done and the metrics were being hit that we would propose in the in the RFP. So this is not a staffer from Phoenix relocating and staying in an extended stay hotel, but you're confident you can keep eyes and ears on what's going on down there because it is it is quite a distance. Um, I guess that that's something. Um, and this is for I think the previous contracts that failed where I think for two and three years, and this is just to get us through the next year and then decide what we want to do. Is that a fair summary? Mayor Councilman Waring, that is correct. No staff member would be relocating into Mexico. They would be doing the work that we've done back and forth with, with our Mexico offices. And yes, it is on a very short term. Staff would propose for one year while we bring a, a, a long-term global strategy back to you in late spring. Uh, to be able to then run a complete request for proposal should council choose that that's something that you want to pursue in international activity, then we would move forward with a full solicitation. By the time we were wrapped up and back to council, we'd be about a year from now to come back to you and that would uh, allow our activity in Mexico, or embassy on Mexico City to continue during that time. So by full solicitation, you mean going back to the thing we just rejected a month or two ago? <clears throat> a Mayor Councilman Waring, uh, the direction we got from Council on November 6th was you were interested in looking at an entire global strategy as opposed to just one country. So we would come back to you with 
you know, looking at activities in Asia and the UK and uh, in Canada and Mexico and, and other countries. So we would spend this time looking at what that global strategy would look like as opposed to just one country. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm hopeful that in addition to the, the uh, partners you just outlined, we may also be able to work more closely with our council's office and with our universities. Both have, uh, those partners have said that they would like to help us and can offer many things at Councilman Waring's favorite price, which is free. Mayor? Uh, I, uh, Councilwoman Pastor was next and then um, we will get to everyone, but I think almost every member of the council has raised their hands. Councilwoman Pastor. So my understanding is that basically uh, we killed the Mexico trade. We, there was, in the spring, there was an ask for an extension, we killed that. Then the two weeks, three weeks ago, whenever the Mexico uh, trade piece came about, uh, the votes weren't there, so we killed that. Now, uh, now the solution is to uh, now come up with a different way of approach and uh, put a new RFP out there so then there's not a person uh, directly involved in the sense of a third person. Now you're saying that you're going to have an office person uh, to oversee this and I'm not sure why we didn't do this from the very beginning. I would like that question answered. Uh, secondly, what are the met metrics of this and how are they going to monitor and make sure that the work is getting done? Um, I was taught uh, by my father uh, at a very, uh, in a work ethic way, uh, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So how do you monitor all of this? Um, and where's the additional funding coming from for this? And and because. If we could have done it ourselves, we should have just been doing it from the very beginning. So, Mayor Councilman Pastor, uh, going back, you are correct on, on the items that staff has brought forward on the solicitation and then on the extension of the contract. Council opted not to move forward on those. You're absolutely correct. The program that we have before you today is a much scaled down version we would not have the staff capable to be able to handle the full version of the RFP that we brought forward to you previously. This is a scaled down version on a short term for us to be able to um, reopen our offices as we've heard that there's some interest for that to be able to reopen. Uh, the location for the money, it won't cost what it cost previously for uh, having a third party independent oversee our two offices. So the plan would be, uh, should council ask us to move forward with this, it would come out of the same uh, reinvestment fund that the original contract was planned to come out of that we brought forward to you uh, earlier this year. So with this global strategy, or will we be using the same amount uh, in the reinvestment fund as if uh, as if it was uh, the trade office in Mexico. Mayor Councilman Pastor, for a global program, the council would have to consider if that's something that you'd like to move forward with, um, appropriating that in the budget. We wouldn't have the ability to be able to port, support something that would need that robust of a program within our reinvestment fund. That would have to be something that council would choose in the future to move into uh, the general fund and through the budgeting process. It'll cost us more to have a global strategy. That's what I'm hearing. Yes. And that'll be up, up to us to, to determine that. Yes. And how much. Um, meanwhile, to me, uh, we had a, a perfect plan. Now we're doing a, a, a scaled down plan in order to now write an RFP for a global uh, plan. Um, so it's very disappointing to know that this is the process and this is how this all happens in the sense that an RFP was written, it was fine to have been written, many people wrote the RFP or put their recommendations from the council and then we killed it and now we're gonna go to a global plan when we should have done that from the very beginning. So just expressing my. Council Member Garcia and then we will go to Councilman Nowakowski and then Councilman DeCicio and then the Vice Mayor. <laughs> Thank you so much for all the work. I think I was one of the ones who asked for 
uh, different ways to keep this office going. I was able to, after our meeting, kind of pay attention to what was happening in Hermosillo. Um, we had some folks come and speak. I, I think this gives us a great opportunity to continue the work. It might not be at the same level, but I'm really excited that we're able to at least keep the connection going. I know there were some deals and some things already in process, so hopefully we could recuperate those. Um, and I just want to, again, be supportive of it and, and let you know that I'm, I'm at the disposal to support it in any way that uh, our office can help. Councilman Nowakowski and then Decisio. Uh, Mayor, I just want to thank our staff. What a great opportunity we have to really work together with all of our partners within Mexico and, and other countries and looking at the global um, aspect when it comes to trade. You know, in Edmosillo, Mexico City, we have a lot of partnerships there where they want to work directly with the city, and this is the opportunity for them to actually work directly with us where we can basically guide them to the right directions when it comes to um, planning and zoning, how to get a loan, and things like that. Um, they, they impress, they're very impressed by our staff here at the city. Every time they come in, we host them um, either through my office or other offices, and it's, it's a great opportunity to keep that program alive. Our sister cities program lurk, working along with this um, trade is, is the way to go, I believe. I believe we as politicians use the sister cities program to build those relationships with the elected officials and keep the cultural aspect of it alive, and then we use our economic development um, department to make sure that we bring in the businesses and um, so far, it's, um, it's looking very well. I've been um, talking to other groups, such as CPLC and other organizations that are coming out with small business loans to help some of these um, businesses in Mexico to come down and to actually open up and um, to get those loans that they can't get from traditional banks and stuff like that. I think those are the type of opportunities we have. And working with universities, it's incredible how many resources we have there that we haven't tapped into in the past that we are going to be tapping into to the future. So I'd like to thank everyone who's worked on this, and I see it as a great opportunity for us not just to work with Mexico, but with also Canada, China, the U.K., and Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And I Thank you for the time. Um, I, just going back in history a little bit, uh, the last time we dealt with this, there were a lot of accolades given to other individuals, but people forgot that the main individual who drove this was Councilman Nowakowski. Uh, he had been talking about it about for years. The mayor, um, uh, Mayor Gallego, she picked up the ball, started running on this. So there was a lot of activity on this. I remember Michael and I met with uh, then Mayor Stanton and got this thing started off the ball. So people forget that little history what occurred back then, especially when they're talking about who did what. So there's a strong interest up here for us to be able to make sure that we work with our largest trading partner. Um, there's no reason for us not to be working with them better than we had been in the past. And those steps that we took in the, you know, in, at the city of Phoenix, I believe, have helped. So looking at this moving forward, and I think it's great because we always talk political speak and we talk from government official to government official, but Government officials don't create the jobs. They don't, uh, they're not the individuals that are out there, and I think you understand that, Chris, more than anybody. So one of the things that I would like to see, whether it's an organization like CPLC or whomever that is that we want to see, we want to work with, and I don't think it'll take a full year for us to do that. It should be done quickly. I mean, I think we're going to find organizations around the country. Um, is that we actually work business to business. You know, the small business owners, the large guys, the big corporations, they already know how to do trade. This is what they do. And it's not that complicated, but it is. It can be when you're dealing with trades with other nations. But the small business owners, the medium-sized business owners, are the ones that we should be connecting with. Now, I've gone on some of these missions, and you, know, you sit around, you talk all politicians. They're not the job creators. You know, it's great. It's great talking about universities because we need them. You know, we need them to be part of the mix. But it's the small business owners, it is the medium-sized business owners that don't know how to do this. Whether it's those business owners in Mexico or those business owners here in the United States, there's the connections that need to occur. And I've got to tell you from my end of it, I 
really appreciated the work that others did, but it's time to take this to a new level. And that new level means approaching these small business owners and coming up with a plan to approach those business owners and how they do trade. And if we're talking about getting better relationships, what better relationship can you ever have when you're dealing with an individual on the other side, on the phone or in person, where you're communicating with them and you understand each other's cultures because you're gonna to have to deal with that when you deal with business owners in Mexico and up here. We're each gonna to have to learn that out. But I would like to see a stronger emphasis in an organization that can approach those small business owners, those medium-sized business owners that the big guys don't approach. Um, we do, we like talking to the big guys because it's easy. But at the end of the day, the real work is going to be done with those individuals. And we've got to find an organization or individuals that can do that communication to them. And it's work. It's a lot of hard work. And it's great to have the parties, and it's great to do that, because I think it keeps the, the, pol you know, the political side of it together, because you need that, too. But at the end of the day, the real work is done by those small guys. And that's really what we ought to be focused on. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, well, I just want to thank Steph. Thank you so much, Chris, for all the work that you guys put into this. I know that I was one of those people that had these questions. I wanted to look at this a little bit more. Um, sorry, newcomer, right, coming coming in. Um, but you know, I just want to you know, I just want to say how excited it's going to be for us to be able to like help you know put put a lot of this stuff together. Um, being out with Councilman Nowakowski um, in Nogales a few a few weeks ago, a few months, maybe two months ago, just being able to see the potential that that we have out there um, for me, it was it's also urgent to try to figure out a way how do we reopen our offices again, but then trying to like bring in new ideas as well. Me and my office are also very committed to trying to trying to figure out how we can also help. But with that being said, Mexico is by far our state's largest trading partner, and I believe that it is vital with, for the, that the city of Phoenix continues to lead the way in making economic and cultural bridges with our southern neighbor. I believe that this is an interim Mexico strategy, provides the city of Phoenix with the right balance of oversight and innovation, with built-in metrics to evaluate the performance of whoever is awarded the solicitation. Our city, our taxpayers, and our constituents deserve to have a measurable return on our investment. The bridges that we are seeking to build with Mexico should be real and defendable. I believe that this is the right strategy. I would like to thank I would like to thank you guys once again and the whole team for all the great and diligent work that you guys are doing to making sure that we have great success in Mexico. Thank you. Councilwoman Stark. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we could go on with what you're proposing because I'd like to understand a little bit more what we're doing here because we did vote no just a few weeks ago not to move forward and now we want to move forward. So I want to have a better understanding so if we could maybe move forward with that. Mayor well, Councilman Stark, I'll turn it over to Gretchen Wolf to, to finish that. Mayor Gallego, council members. So if directed to implement the short-term strategy, staff would issue a solicitation for services to open the Hermosillo and Mexico offices. There would be minimum qualifications for the solicitations. Each proposer would be required to have a physical presence in the city or cities in which it wanted to provide the services. So a proposer could propose for one city or both, but they would need to provide documentation to show that they had that presence in the city and that that presence was there for at least one year prior to the proposal deadline. Each proposer would also be required to have three years experience either with economic development or Mexico trade development services. Um, there will be no subcontracting um, in the contracts that are awarded through this process, so it, the successful proposer or proposers would need to self-perform all of the services. And just like with all of our other city vendors, the recommended proposer or recommended proposers would need to be authorized to transact business in the state of Arizona before being brought forward to you for your consideration. An evaluation panel would review the responsive proposals based on the evaluation criteria before you. So the proposer's qualifications and experience would have the most weight. So that's the entity that would be proposing. Uh, that would be followed by both the primary staff's qualifications and experience, as well as the proposer's proposed approach to the scope of work, how they're going to accomplish um, the work that we describe and meet the metrics that are defined in the RFP or uh, solicitation. 
And then finally, we would evaluate fees. Back to you, Chris. As we look at a, as we look at a long-term global strategy, uh, it is, it, it, it's important to know that the city continues to grow and the city continues to move into other areas. We're growing jobs, we're working on becoming more recession-proof, we're working on uh, creating a true global strategy in not only in export, uh, but also in business to business. So we've got a significant number of businesses here and our role is to provide them more consumers for their product so they can continue to grow here in, in Phoenix. As we look at our international opportunities, 40% of, 40 of the businesses that you see from uh, the following countries, Canada, Mexico, China, um, Taiwan, <laughs> almost lost that one, Mayor, that was a bad one. Uh, Taiwan, the UK, and the Republic of Korea, about 40% of our businesses originate, our international businesses originate from those countries. Uh, to the point that you made, Mayor, just a short bit ago, our partners are what's important. As we look at moving an international strategy forward, it would be through partnerships with the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, with our consular offices, with our sister cities programs, with our universities, and with others. I'll turn it back over to Gretchen to walk you through both the short and long-term strategy. So for our timeline, we're here now asking for authorization to issue the solicitation. Again, that would be for uh, one or two organizations to provide direct services in Mexico. If approved, the solicitation would be issued later this month with proposal deadline in late January. We would come back to you next year with both the award recommendation for the short-term one-year contracts for the Mexico offices and with plans for a long-term global strategy and in that, we would also request any required solicitations uh, with the end goal of having this implemented for 2021. And back to you again, Chris. Mayor, members of the council, uh, staff's recommendation would be to request city council authorize the solicitation uh, for Mexico offices for one year. And then in the spring of 2020, staff will return with a recommendation for a long-term global strategy and the staffing needs required to support that. Uh, and we'd be happy to continue taking questions. Wonderful, thank you. And as you move forward, I would love to see us look at the potential locates, particularly that GPEC and others are involved with, where they are geographically, and make sure that our international strategy so, uh, supports those, company, those countries where we're most likely to have uh, locates here. So we have also been very focused on export-import, but as we get more of that investment directly in our community, that's something that's a priority of mine. And I, I join Councilwoman Williams in saying international air service is a priority, and as much as we can align our economic development strategy with our goals on international air service development, I think that would be wonderful. Certainly high on my list is a nonstop to Asia. Taiwan? What? Taiwan? <laughs> That, that would be excellent. Mm -hmm. And I'd also challenge us as much as possible to leverage our existing investments. For example, we have been a strong supporter of Thunderbird. How can we make sure we take advantage of the city's partnership and get as much as possible out of the great resources that, that we have in our community? Uh, we do have one card from Mike Huckins of the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. It's a pleasure to be back before you this afternoon. Uh, Mike Huckins with the Greater Phoenix Chamber of Commerce. Thank you again for uh, having me testify this afternoon on this issue. Uh, we applaud the city for taking a longer-term global strategy at trade opportunities and look forward to hearing the staff recommendations um, early next year. We hope to be, be a part of those conversations along with the organizations that were on the slide earlier. In the near term, we do, however, ask that you um, approve the, council, the staff's recommendation to issue a solicitation 
invitation to reopen the city's trade offices in Mexico. As I mentioned at the previous council meeting, um, since, the Phoenix, since Phoenix opened those trade offices in 2014, uh, the offices have been a tremendous success, especially to the smaller businesses, small and medium businesses, such as uh, the ones that Councilman DeCicio um, mentioned earlier. They really give um, Phoenix and the Phoenix business owners with ex exposure and resources in one of the world's uh, largest markets. Uh, while, again, we support the longer-term global approach, uh, Mexico is by far our largest trading partner. The benefits are real, the benefits are tangible, uh, especially given the news today, now that Congress has signaled they are uh, looking at moving forward on the USMCA. We're very pleased with that. Um, so we, th if we feel like it's imperative to get these um, offices back up and running um, as soon as possible. And thank you, Mayor and Council. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Well, you may also want to mention, Mike, though, too, is that if you look at the global market right now, a lot of individuals are shifting their operations from the, uh, from the, uh, the Far East over into Mexico because of the labor, the proximity to the markets and all that, too. I mean, there is a movement already occurring, and I think as a state we should be taking advantage of that as a city. Yes, uh, Councilman DeCicio, Mayor, it's a, good, it's a point well taken. Uh, again, you know, those other trading partners out there are, are valuable, but the benefits uh, for Mexico can't be denied, and uh, your point is well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman Williams. <clears throat> I was just, <clears throat> pardon me, sitting here thinking, when you're talking about international, <clears throat> Could you talk to all the biosciences facilities that we have? Because I think that's a great business for our future. And I know they are working with other countries extensively. And that would be a good selling point for getting additional international air service. So I would appreciate it if you could follow up on that. Mayor Councilman Williams will absolutely add that onto our list and, and take care of that. Thank you. Councilwoman Pastor. Gretchen, I have a question for you. On the minimum qualifications, weren't these minimum, minimum qualifications part of the original RFP? That's a great question, but I would like to pull up that RFP rather Thank than you. rely on my memory. So the three years experience. Or what's the difference? Okay. So Thank you. The three... Mayor and uh, Councilwoman Pastor, the three years experience is very similar for the previous solicitation. It was three years experience providing Mexico trade development consulting services because we are looking at a targeted audience here because we want a company that is in the market. Um, that three years experience is a little broader here. So it's economic development services or Mexico trade services. So there's a, a small difference there to widen that opportunity and then that physical presence is a new requirement that was not in the previous RFP. Okay, so that's the, just the only difference, is the one year. Um, no, it's, it's not, the three years is the same in Correct. both solicitations. It's just for the original RFP, it was you needed to have three years experience with Mexico trade right. services. So you added, Here we're broadening that, so people who may have different types of economic development service. So you're adding could. economic development and um, in your rubric where it says proposers uh, qualification and experience, uh, what would economic development be? How do you define economic development? How do you define or narrow down the experience? I mean, that's pretty broad. I mean, I could say I have economic development and said I've done these following things. I would assume I would qualify. Uh, Mayor Gallego and Councilwoman Pastor. Um, so the <coughs> procurement process has two steps. Um, typically, we do have the minimum qualifications. So reviewing proposals to verify the minimum qualifications is a staff function. So the procurement officer would review to make sure that somewhere in the, RF, uh, in the proposal, we can see that the proposer has that experience. Once we've identified that a proposer is responsive, they've met those minimum qualifications, they got in on time, they gave us everything that we need. Those responsive proposals then go to an evaluation panel. The panel then, through a consensus process, will talk about, well, th this proposer has economic development experience with these types of companies, 
or this proposer has experience with these types of companies who are actually doing trade with the U.S. And the panel would come through a consensus process to award points in each evaluation criteria area and identify the recommended proposer. Well, thank you for that. I just needed clarity of what the difference was between Sorry. the last proposal, the last RFP yeah. versus this one, and it's just economic development. For the, That's what I'm saying. It, it sounds like. For the minimum qualifications, yes. that and the requirement for the presence to already be in one okay. of the two cities. And your global strategy, and looking at the long-term global strategy, aren't we right now in the midst of a global uh, market? I know Chris is going to Taiwan on Wednesday, and uh, I look at that as we're already doing global market and global strategy. And if, if I have listened to this whole discussion uh, and the, the argument uh, for the Mexico piece, it was that people would rather deal with uh, direct with the city. So in this global strategy, wouldn't we want uh, direct services from the city? I mean, we're, we're basically creating another RFP for another middle person. That's how I'm looking at it. So could you please clarify if I'm looking at it wrong? Mayor Councilman Pastor, as we look at coming forward and in our recommendation, you'll see that it, it said that, uh, would you mind moving that forward to the, to the uh, recommendation? We'll come forward with that staffing proposal. So that's as we, as we do a deep dive on these strategies, as we look at what countries, uh, to Councilwoman Williams' point, where our biosciences, where we're doing business, where our companies are, where our international flights are, looking at being able to leverage some of the resources that we have already within within the region, whether it is with our, our consular corps, whether it's with others, and then looking at the, to your point, is it that we should be doing it internally with our staff, and that we come forward to say, Mayor, Council members, we think we need X number of staff members to be able to handle these things directly on a more robust program, as opposed to one-offs when we are working directly with a couple of companies that have interest in being in the U.S., but someone that would be able to go out and mine those prospects and bring those back to us, as opposed to we get to the point where we know we've got three or four companies and I can handle those three or four companies on a, on a, you know, on a sales mission myself, but going out and finding those companies sometimes takes a little bit more manpower. And we may come back to you and say, we think that it's, I'm gonna make this up, adding four staff members would be the way to do this, as opposed to having someone in the middle. But we also need someone that has that expertise in those, those countries and those areas. So I agree with the mayor in the sense that uh, we have probably a good foundation and base in the global world in that sense. And I agree with uh, partnering up uh, with those with ASU, uh, I'm thinking of Thunderbird, uh, but partnering up with those entities and really working at a long-term strategy plan that possibly uh, won't cost the city any money and really working together as, as as an entity, we're members of GPAC and how that globally operates. So, um, perfect, thank you. And I should clarify, I, I think there are some investments that will take money so it won't all come at, at Jim Waring's favorite price. But there are things like we've been trying with, it, with paid consultants to get the Aeromexico flight back together. Maybe we can work more closely with the Mexican consul's office and try other strategies. So. Some of it will require paid professional support, but I have found that there are so many people who want to help the city of Phoenix with our international strategy, from our universities to the consular corps to uh, people who have lived in those countries, and I just think we may need to look at do we have the appropriate resources to leverage those potential partners. No one has, do we have a motion? So I, I'll make I'll, the motion to approve staff's recommendation. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Uh, by a vote of eight to one, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for your hard work on this. We look forward to more work with our international partners. We are adjourned. <laughs>